Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for giving up your happy hour to come talk about infectious diseases. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is the Big Data and Genomics Equals Better Disease Detection Panel. My name is Jennifer Gardy. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been an associate professor at the University of British Columbia School of Population and Public Health, where I've worked on using DNA sequencing as a technology to understand uh, pathogen transmission. Uh, just about three weeks ago, I transitioned to a new role, though, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where I am Deputy Director of Surveillance Data and Epidemiology, and I'm joined tonight by two amazing friends. I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, good evening. I'm David Blazes. I'm also at the Gates Foundation. I've been there about three years. Uh, I'm a physician epidemiologist, so I kind of bridge um, the nexus between clinical care, uh, I specialize in infectious diseases, uh, and outbreak investigation. Good evening. My name is Sherry Lewis, and I am with the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, my background is public health, and I have worked for about the last uh, 17 years or so in the development and implementation of electronic disease surveillance systems, both here in the United States as well as overseas. And I'll be talking a little bit more about you know, all the challenges associated uh, with that development as we move forward. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, whether it was SARS in 2003, H1N1 in 2009, Ebola in West Africa in 2014, or Zika in 2015, after every major outbreak, after every worldwide pandemic, we and our colleagues in public health always talk about what we could have done better. And we talk about things like building more laboratories to diagnose infectious disease. We talk about things like strengthening uh, health systems capacity in lower and middle income countries. We talk about putting more money into the WHO. We talk and we talk and we talk and sometimes we even do, uh, but it turns out that nothing ever really seems to work. We're always invariably surprised when the next big infectious disease event comes along. So clearly we need to be doing something better when it comes to detecting outbreaks early. And it's now more important than ever because we really do live in a highly interconnected and global world and infectious disease is just don't respect international borders. It's very easy for a pathogen that emerges on one side of the globe to be found on the other side of the world within the space of you know hours or even days. So as public health officials, we really need to be better at spotting these little sparks, spotting these outbreaks early before they blossom into these big raging wildfires. And we all think that the tool that's going to help us to get there and actually make a difference is data. So if you look back, the way that public health's relationship with data uh, has been over the last two decades has changed dramatically. We've really come a long way. So in places like the United States, we are now routinely collecting in real time data about what diseases are happening and where they're happening, but there's certainly a lot of room for improvement. We could be collecting better and more data. We could be using the data that we're collecting a lot more smarter, a lot more creatively. We could be collecting different types of data too. You'll hear tonight about how we can start using genomic data, DNA and RNA sequencing data as a tool to track pathogens. And we need to think about how do we do this not just here in a well-resourced setting like North America or Western Europe, but around the world. So if you look back at the history of public health, in the 19th century, it was really sanitation that made a difference. In the 20th century, it was things like antibiotics and vaccines. And we really think that in the 21st century, it's going to be data, digital data, genomic data collected around the world that's really going to make a difference when it comes to public health. So all of us have slightly different backgrounds. I come from genomics and computational biology, Sherry's from disease surveillance, Dave is a physician, but we all work in the field of infectious disease epidemiology and for the purposes of tonight's conversation, that's really just tracking infectious diseases. And the roots of infectious disease epidemiology go back to the 19th century uh, when John Snow, uh, and these days you actually have to define which John Snow, this is the physician <laughs> John Snow, not the like handsome one from Game of Thrones. It would be great if it was, but this is handsome, uh, old school physician Jon Snow. He was working in London in the 19th century and he investigated a cholera outbreak in London's Soho neighborhood. If you've ever spent any time in London and you've hung out at interesting bars, they're in this neighborhood. But if you'd been there 150 years ago, uh, you probably would have got cholera instead of a good night out um, because there was a raging outbreak going on. And Snow and his team investigated this outbreak by going around, knocking on people's doors 
doors and asking, has there been a case of cholera in this household? And if there was, they put a little tick mark, a little black notch on that map. And when they zoomed back and looked at this map, they realized that most of the cases were clustered around a particular intersection, uh, Broad Street and Little Windmill Street. And there was a water pump at that corner. So they hypothesized that cholera was coming from this particular pump. They took the handle off and the disease outbreak abated. So this was really sort of the first example of public health epidemiology in action. I love this story because it's one of the first public health data visualizations in action. But the truth is that when it comes to investigating infectious disease outbreaks, not a lot has actually changed since John Snow's investigation in 1868. We have slightly better tools at our disposal, but we still rely heavily on going out in the field and talking to people. So maybe, David, this is your sort of area of expertise. Could you walk us through uh, what modern disease outbreak investigation actually looks like? Sure, maybe I should dance to the music next Go door. Go for it, <laughs> yeah, I, oh, I would love to see that. <laughs> sure, thanks. So, so most outbreaks of infectious disease um, these days are not what you see made into movies like Contagion or books like The Hot Zone or what you read about on the front page of the, of the Times. Those high, uh, um, high profile outbreaks certainly grab our attention and, and rightly so, but they're actually pretty rare and really just the tip of the proverbial iceberg of all outbreaks. In reality, outbreaks occur many times each day in all corners of the world, including here in the US. They occur in cities and towns, in schools and restaurants, in nursing homes and daycare centers, uh, in hospitals, and even at events like this. So be careful out there. <laughs> in fact, the CDC uses the venerable church picnic outbreak as one of its classic teaching cases for its disease detectives, the Epidemic Intelligence Service. So also avoid the potato salad at all costs. <laughs> But don't avoid the wine, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm very jealous of people who have wine out there. <laughs> so if outbreaks are so common, why don't we hear more about them? In most cases, our excellent public health systems detect and manage outbreaks very efficiently, minimizing the impact on population health. In places with less developed health systems, so some of the poor countries out there, sometimes we just don't even recognize outbreaks, which is probably less than ideal. In terms of recognizing outbreaks, there are actually numerous ways that we identify these events. Defining an outbreak is actually very context dependent. So we have to know something in a systematic fashion about the health of a population that we're interested in. And this is what we call disease surveillance. Uh, disease surveillance can be as simple as uh, a single person out there counting cases of illness um, in a spreadsheet, or it can be as complex as an automated system with built-in uh, algorithm detection uh, systems. And Sherry will talk about a little bit more about this in a little bit. But probably the most common way to detect an outbreak still relies on that astute clinician, your favorite doctor or nurse who you see when you're sick. In her clinic, that doctor will take note of when she sees an abnormal case or a series of cases, and a light bulb goes off in her head and says, I probably need to report this to somebody. She reports this concern to her local public health office. And their job is actually to collate similar reports from all around the region. And the local public health office then analyzes this collective data and looks for patterns that might indicate an, if an outbreak is present. And this is exactly how the first cases of AIDS were identified in Los Angeles in the early 1990s. A doctor noticed an unusually high number of cases of rare pneumonia that were being seen in a population of gay men. Similar trends were seen in New York City and other, other large cities around the country. Uh, the same process applies for outbreaks, not just of human disease, but animals too. So in 1999, a veterinarian in New York City noticed a large bird die off. And this happened to be coincident with an increase in the number of cases of fatal encephalitis or a brain infection in humans. And guess what this was? This turned out to be the first introduction of West Nile virus into the United States. So a, a bird and animal disease kind of paralleled each other. And finally, even our laboratory workers should remain alert. So, so they're working uh, on their lab bench every day, and if they notice a rare pathogen, they should probably report that to the public health office so that they can follow that up. But occasionally, outbreaks are inadvertently missed by our astute colleagues. Um, but guess what? There's nothing to worry about. We have other cool ways these days to, to help detect outbreaks, and they rely on data. One is called event-based surveillance, which really relies on the digital information that, that is out there surrounding us. So online news, social media. And this is used uh, to augment traditional surveillance, not to replace it. Uh, there are various platforms out there that many of you may have seen. 
the chief among those is HealthMap, which is uh, run out of Boston and, uh, and collates a bunch of these uh, types of, of information. We already mentioned that most outbreaks are not large. So you might ask the question, why do we care if, if these events are so small in most cases? The problem is really that outbreaks sometimes don't remain small. Especially with contagious diseases, cases can expand uh, exponentially if unchecked, and an outbreak can become an epidemic. Um, the most classic case of this is in 1918, when an influenza outbreak that began in Kansas spread around the globe and killed more than 50 million people. We really don't want a repeat of that event. So in order to control outbreaks, we conduct formal outbreak investigations, which are kind of like solving puzzles. The key questions uh, would include things like, what is the pathogen that's causing the outbreak? From where did it come from? If you know where it came from, you can probably know more about it. How is it spreading within a population? And most importantly, how can we control or stop the spread? So outbreak investigations are conducted mostly by local public health officials because they understand the local context the best. They can request CDC support, of course, but this is generally only done if the outbreak is large or if it crosses jurisdictional or, or state boundaries. So when a disease can spread from person to person, um, we're often more worried about those types of outbreaks. And we try to determine what we call chains of transmission. So how is it spreading from person to person? And we do that uh, through contact tracing. Uh, this contact tracing actually involves interviewing every single case of, of illness and also the people they interacted with. So the, whether it's at work, at school, uh, in their activities of daily life. You can imagine this is very time consuming. Actually, the logo of the CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service is a globe with a worn out shoe on it. And that shoe actually is earned uh, from the many miles it takes to walk from house to house. So it's kind of a, 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 I think, a nice story. In my prior life, I actually took part in an investigation of a hemorrhagic fever um, outbreak in Cochabamba, Bolivia in the mid 2000s. Uh, we had a, a multidisciplinary team that consisted of doctors, uh, epidemiologists, biologists, uh, and even lab workers who came to the field. And we studied uh, all the humans who were, who were infected and a bunch of different animals in the field to identify the source of this virus. It turned out to be a pesky rodent, and uh, kind of like that. Uh, we worked, <laughs> kind of like yeah, that. <laughs> we worked very closely with the local public health officials, um, but also with the affected populations. And it's really important to, to uh, remember that, it, that these are not just cases, they're people. Um, so we took every opportunity to build trust and provide transparent and timely information. So that's outbreak investigation in a nutshell, and that is definitely obviously a big job of what we all do in public health, but we also do something called surveillance. And I always feel the need to explain that, like now that my title is Deputy Director of Surveillance Data and Epidemiology, that is good surveillance. This is not us sitting in a van outside your house, looking through your windows, spying on you. When we talk about surveillance in the public health context, we're really talking about you know, that sort of 35,000 foot look at what diseases are spreading around a population. Sherry, this is very much your, sort of your domain of expertise. Maybe you could walk us what modern disease surveillance sure. looks like. So the, um, the, the examples that Jen and Dave have both given so far really have talked about a manual process, you know, going out, talking to people, gathering information, a lot of what you would consider, you know, pen and paper types of, of work. Um, and then so in the 1990s, a lot more data were made available electronically. Okay, so that really was the first time that public health started to at least think that, hey, maybe we should take advantage of some of this data uh, and look at things prospectively, as opposed to always looking at the past. You know, they were always waiting for there to be an outbreak, and then they would go back and look back in time and understand, you know, what had taken place. But now that there was all this data available, maybe they should take a look at it and, and use it prospectively. So in the late 1990s, uh, there were organizations, much like APL, who started looking at the development of electronic disease surveillance systems to take advantage of data that were already out there. Um, and the purpose of that was to identify an intentional biological attack. Okay, so that was the initial thought because the CDC had issued a report and said, you know, this, this threat may be more real than, than we initially thought. So that was really going on in the 1990s. Then the events of 9-11-2001 happened, and then the anthrax attacks happened about a month later, and then public health really quickly realized, hey, you know what, we really need to be doing more. 
Um, so they, you know, it, what didn't happen overnight because it really represented a culture shift, but um, public health started to embrace the fact that they needed to utilize data and they needed to get a better handle of what was going on in their community in real time. So today, um, the system that I'm going to talk about a little bit more is really used to gather routine um, illness information in the community because they recognize that, that you want, if you want a system to be used in the case of an emergency, you're going to have to use it every day. So they use these systems to track illnesses such as influenza, uh, gastrointestinal diseases, et cetera. And so over time, they really did become part of the daily workflow of the epidemiologists. And they really have become commonplace throughout um, countries like the United States. About 10 or so years ago, there was also a big push in low and middle income countries to develop disease surveillance capacity. Um, and that obviously, you know, for a number of reasons. So you hear about infectious disease outbreaks like Ebola, and there, so there are per, parts of the world where some of these uh, infectious disease outbreaks are more likely to happen. So there's obviously a need to, to implement surveillance capability there as well. Um, the World Health Organization also put in place what they call the International Health Regulations, or IHR. And that really was a requirement that was set forth for all WHO member countries to be able to uh, report any kind of illness that would represent a public health emergency. So now you have another reason to, to think about building that capacity worldwide. But let me first talk a little bit more about what I mean when I say electronic disease surveillance system. So the system that we developed at APL is called Essence, and the, um, what we, when we were setting out to develop it, we stopped and said, okay, let's think about what do people do when they get sick? Are there data sources that we can, uh, we can use to try to capture that early behavior um, when people are ill? So stop and think about it for a second. What do you do um, when you're not feeling well or where you're, when your children aren't feeling well? You may stay home from work. You may keep your kids home from school. Uh, you may go down to the local drugstore and you may buy some kind of over-the-counter medicine. If you still aren't feeling any better, you may go to your doctor. And if things get really bad, you may end up in the emergency department. So these systems were originally called syndromic surveillance systems. And the reason was is that the data were binned into what we call syndrome groups. So if you showed up in the emergency department with a fever and a sore throat, you were going to be binned into what we called febrile illness. If you ate that uh, proverbial potato salad at the church picnic that David mm -hmm. talked about and you regretted that decision later on, you may go and get that anti-nausea medication and now you're going to get bent into the gastrointestinal illness. So basically there were syndrome groups that ranged from everything from respiratory illness, gastrointestinal illness, all the way through rash and neurological conditions. And early public health, uh, you know, the early public health folks who were working on this spent a lot of time categorizing various things uh, into syndrome groups. So you, they were very opportunistic with respect to what data were available. So everybody wants their money, so uh, hospitals and doctors you know, routinely would collect data and in the form of billing codes. And so we would look at billing codes and bin them into syndrome groups. Um, obviously, you know, your drugstore is going to be uh, needing inventory control. So when you make multiple purchases of, of some item, that information is accessible to public health. So um, as you can imagine, it was just really trying to figure out what kind of data could people tap into. Um, there was a lot of research that actually went on in those early years as well to say, you know, what other data sources could we use? And so research was done by a number of groups on a variety of different data sources like TV viewership, orange juice sales, toilet flushes. <laughs> All, I mean, the, it was really, you know, the skies was the limit in terms of what kind of things people were looking at. But what they were really trying to capture was, is there a data source out there that will help me understand if people are staying home from work, um, if people are feeling sick at work, uh, or if they were just trying to do something and buy something to ward off that common cold. But as you can imagine, and as you all know, because you, we live in such a, a data-rich world now, over the past you know, 15, 20 years, the data types have, have grown, the volume has grown, and the timeliness and the speed with which that data are available has also grown as well. 
So once the data are in the system, there are alerting algorithms that are run against the data to identify statistical anomalies. Now, I always caution people to say, just because something is statistically anomalous <laughs> does not make it epidemiologically significant. And so it just gives that epidemiologist that little hint or that clue, hey, maybe I need to dig down a little bit further in this area and understand if there's something that I really should be concerned about in the community. So they, when they get those anomalies, they're able to look at them in both space as well as time. So they can look at them on a map to understand if maybe they're having some kind of clustering in a certain part of their, um, in their community, or they can look at it on a time series or a bar chart, really however they prefer to view the data. So fast forward to today, and those systems are used widely in local state health departments and even federal entities here in the United States. And now they're really commonly referred to as disease surveillance systems, no longer syndromic surveillance systems. And that's because public health, who's become so adept at using this data, are no, more, no longer really reliant on just alert lists that are generated in these systems. They really know what the issues and the challenges are facing their community today, and they query these systems all the time to look for um, items that may be, uh, you know, worth that that further investigation. And so for the first time, you know, th this has really represented them having that data on the health of their population right at their very, you know, fingertips. So while the challenge in countries like the United States is really how do you effectively collect and store and analyze this just ever increasing volume of data, the problem in low and middle income countries is how do you even acquire the data to begin with? So in these situations, we really, the public health end users need to be creative and they need to meet the data where it is. So by that I mean that individuals need to go out, so community health workers or somebody working in a clinic needs to utilize their phone or a tablet and collect that data at the actual point of interface with that uh, individual who's, in, who's being seen. They need to capture that information and they use SMS or uh, text over Wi-Fi, um, and then it brings that data back into the database. The analysis and visualization is still very much run, just like I talked about in you know, the systems here in the US, but now the alerting algorithms have really been um, challenged to you know, make sure that it includes issues with low data volume that you can imagine that you're gonna get, some missing data, and even some data dropouts. So even though the systems are maybe different in terms of complexity, their fundamental purpose is exactly the same, and that's really to enable public health to get a timelier picture of what's going on in their community. So here in the U.S., that's close to real time. So you know, any, you know, in, in real time fashion, people can get a picture of what's going on in their community. In low and middle income countries, oftentimes they may not know for a month or months what is going on in their community. So having these systems, if it can move their timeline and they may know on a weekly basis instead of a monthly basis what's going on, that is a huge improvement. And we envision, as, as we'll talk about later on, that that's just going to continue to get better with increasing volumes of data. So let me just give you two quick examples of the way these systems that I've described are currently used today here in the United States. So with, re, uh, with respect to an infectious disease outbreak, I'm sure everybody has been watching the news lately and has seen about the measles outbreak. And that's pretty scary, um, you know, to, to see, um, you know, how all these children are getting sick. Um, but the good news is, is that public health officials uh, all over the country do have these systems where they are able to identify uh, patients who potentially meet the case definition, so they can either look at those individuals, they can also look and see if there is uh, trends in certain geographic regions, they can see how it's potentially spreading in a community, but even better, the development of these surveillance systems has enabled communication amongst public health epidemiologists across the country. They are working together to develop queries so that they can all be looking at the same type of data in their systems. Um, so it's, it's really remarkable when you think about where public health was in the United States just a few short years ago. Now another example, for a non-infectious disease example, um, is you know, once a system is embedded in a community, you can use it for a variety of things. So you probably all also remember the Boston Marathon bombing. The Essence system was in place and running in Boston. And so in near real time, as uh, people were being taken to the hospitals, public health officials were able to see not only where they were presenting, but what injuries they were presenting with. 
But even more importantly, in the days and weeks that followed, public health was able to understand that they had a bigger problem on their hand. There were some behavioral health issues, uh, mental health issues that followed, right, from you know, people being scared. Uh, and, and really, that was a, a very traumatic event. One thing that was very interesting was that uh, on the 4th of July, they saw a huge uptick in cases uh, in behavioral health episodes. And when they dug into the data, they found that it was related to post-traumatic stress disorder, that the uh, fireworks on the 4th of July had triggered all of those memories again of the day of the bombing. So you can see that once these uh, systems are embedded in a community, they have a, they have a huge um, you know, opportunity for public health to really be able to truly meet the needs of the, the people in their community. So, in an ideal world, we are running some sort of surveillance system, like the one that you just described, Sherry, and if we detect a signal, that then triggers a response, like the outbreak investigations that Dave described. But this is obviously going to depend on having the right machinery in place. We need the good surveillance systems, we need the laboratories that are capable of diagnosing these diseases, and most importantly, I think we need the resources and the ability to act on that information. And epidemics like Ebola in West Africa in 2014, I think really underscore the fact that this just isn't always the case. So why not? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, and that's exactly right. So we, as I talked about, uh, a lot of organizations have really tried to build uh, disease surveillance capacity in all countries around the world. And again, I talked about the IHR from the WHO, and that really was trying to also serve as that push as well. But there are so many challenges, as you point out, Jen, with respect to you know, getting those set up. Public health is arguably underfunded in every country of the world, <laughs> and while the desire is often there, there are limited funds, there's limited workforce, and there's many, many, many competing priorities that may take the focus off of building those surveillance systems. So, you know, the success really at the end of the day relies on having a local champion who's on the ground um, to oversee the development and implementation of that system. And when an emergency strikes is not the time to try to start, you know, using a new technology. Um, and so, uh, you know, as was the case, uh, you know, with Ebola in 2014, you know, we all heard that the, you know, health, public health uh, workforce who was already stretched really thin was stretched even thinner, if that's even possible. And then a lot of them were probably personally affected by the outbreak as well. So, you know, one could argue that if that stronger disease surveillance had been, pla had been in place as early as earlier in 2013, uh, we may have been able to reduce the number of cases and you wouldn't have seen 28,000 cases of Ebola in West Africa. So this very fact had already been identified about 20 years prior with the Kikwit Ebola outbreak. When they went back and they looked at it and they said, you know, what could we have done better? To Jen's point before, you know, we talk, we talk, we talk. Well, that was identified. Hey, lack of surveillance capacity was identified as, hey, this is a really big problem. But unfortunately, not much had been done um, in order to, uh, you know, improve that situation. We just mentioned um, 20 years ago, and 20 plus years ago, I was a teenager. Uh, I saw the movie Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman. Uh, hands up if you've seen that movie. I'm Canadian, so I have to apologize for everything. I'm so sorry you had to sit through that. It's a terrible film. Um, but when I saw it as a teenager, I was like, that's what I want to do with the rest of my life. That looks so, so, so exciting. That was literally the thing that drove me into infectious disease epidemiology. Um, and times have really changed since then. You know, I went in with this expectation of what I was going to be doing for my job. Like, let's be Dustin Hoffman in Outbreak. But it's not, it's not that way anymore. What has changed in public health over the last couple decades? Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, the the computing power, now the, all the electronic data that was available in the 90s. So in the early 2000s, you know, that starts to ramp up even more. Public health was still kind of behind the times in, in many respects. Um, you know, I was doing a lot of engagement with uh, local public health departments, and I was really shocked when I saw <laughs> either the lack of computers or the really basic computers that they had in place. And that was here in the United States. So that was a real big hurdle that had to be overcome by the public health community, this real lack of familiarity with technology um, and manipulating the data uh, you know, with such frequency and regularity. That was not something that they were used 
used to. But it has started to um, really become a critical part and an accepted part of the public health workforce. But, but it was a challenge that had to be overcome. And now that they have such a familiarity with this kind of data, they're craving it. Okay, so data is definitely the key. Um, and there's so much better access to data all across the globe. But the key is taking full advantage of it by really refining those data feeds, developing the imp uh, infrastructure to actually process that, storing this ever-increasing volume of data, and then running the right analytics against the data in real time so that we can provide actionable information to public health decision makers. So also, as, as you all well know, I mean, the past 20 years has seen such an influx of um, other data feeds like social media, crowdsourcing data, and even remote sensing data to help us understand the movement of people. I mean, it's really mind-blowing when you think about it and you think about the potential that that data holds. So this sort of data is actually really unique and interesting because it is everywhere. No matter where you are in the world, you're not touched by this data in, in some sense. There are cell phones that are tracking individual movement. There's satellite imagery. We've got both highly individual data, and at the same time, we also have data that gives us this very big 35,000-foot sort of flyover. And together, these two types of public health data are starting to give rise to really a new way of doing epidemiology something that people are calling precision public health. So I was wondering, Dave, maybe you could walk us through what precision public health exactly is. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jen. Um, precision public health is a concept that actually our boss, Sue Desmond Hellman, has championed. Uh, many of you probably know Sue. She's an oncologist who helped to, uh, to develop Herceptin, which is a pioneering medication that really very effectively treats uh, a specific type of breast cancer. So this is a classic example of, of what we call precision medicine, um, where an individual patient is targeted with a very specific therapy for a, or for a specific disease. Precision public health broadens this concept a little bit, um, mainly to target populations and to make them healthier, whether this is a group of college students here at UT or a village in the Andes. Precision public health does require different types of data, though, they have to be accurate, they have to be timely, they have to be geolocated uh, so that we can make the best public health decisions possible. A great example of precision public health um, happened recently in, in Miami-Dade County in 2016. Many of you remember uh, Zika virus is kind of raging around the Americas at the time. Uh, so Zika is transmitted to humans by mosquitoes uh, and leads to serious complications for children who are infected in utero, as you know, the microcephaly and, and other complications. Um, in any case, Miami-Dade County um, instituted several different programs. They were testing mosquitoes throughout the county, um, and they would label which neighborhoods were positive. So they were, uh, each neighborhood was classified as positive or negative. Um, what this did is it allowed public health officials to conduct targeted aerial spraying of insecticide. And what this did is it minimized the exposure of the whole population to insecticides um, while eliminating the positive pools of mosquitoes. In addition to being rapidly effective for killing those mosquitoes, it was also more cost effective. So a really great response. Now, one of the tools that is really helping us achieve this vision of precision public health is my favorite one, which is genomics. This is what I spent the last decade working on. Uh, and I should make clear, before we start to talk about genomics and precision in public health, um, we often talk about precision medicine and genomics. And when we talk about those two things, we're typically talking about human genomes. But when we're talking about precision public health and infectious disease, we're not talking about human genomes and sequencing human DNA. We're talking about sequencing sequencing pathogen DNA, the bacteria, the viruses, the fungi, the parasites that are making us sick. Uh, so by way of a quick refresher around genomics, Genomics 101, uh, a genome is the complete set of genetic instructions that encodes a living thing. Every living thing has a genome. So humans, we have a genome. It's about three billion letters long. Uh, bacteria have genomes. If you were to print out the average bacterial genome, it would be about the length of the book War and Peace. If you were to print out a viral genome, uh, it would be the length of maybe a college term paper or so. Um, but reading the genome of these pathogens, um, it used to be a difficult proposition. You know, I think back to when I started studying microbiology and genetics as an undergrad, and it was the same time that the first bacterial genome had been sequenced. And to sequence that genome, this is back in 1995, it took over a year. It took a room this size full of massive DNA sequencers running 24-7, and it cost about $600,000. 
Now, though, as a result of technological changes, we can sequence hundreds, if not thousands, of bacterial genomes in the space of a few days. We can do it at a cost of about $50 per sample, and instead of requiring a room full of sequencers, we can sequence uh, with little tiny handheld devices. Uh, here is the device depicted, uh, lovingly sketched on your screen. This is the Minion. It's made by a company called Oxford Nanopore. It looks like a stapler, but it's so much cooler. Uh, what this thing does, it, it is honestly the coolest stapler in the history of staplers. Um, it plugs into the USB port on a laptop. So you can literally take this thing anywhere. You could be sequencing here on stage at South By. You could take this into a remote jungle in Sub-Saharan Africa and sequence there. Uh, and basically what you do is you pop it open and a little plastic cartridge fits in. It's a little bit like how you buy a razor um, and you keep the razor blade, but you just pop in a new cartridge every time. This is the same sort of like Gillette model of DNA sequencing. So you pop this little flow cell in and the flow cell, this tiny little piece of plastic, has a whole bunch, hundreds of tiny holes, nanopores, um, and each of these tiny holes, you can pull a piece of DNA through that tiny pore and you can read that DNA in real time as it's going through the pore. So DNA uh, written in a simple four-letter alphabet, A, C, G, and T, those represent chemical bases. These bases are charged. And each of those tiny pores in that flow cell has an electrical current that's passing across the pore. So you pull the little piece of DNA through. If an A goes across that little current field, it's going to disrupt the charge to a certain degree. If a G goes through, it's going to disrupt it to a different degree. So you just read the disruptions in the current, and you can read the piece of DNA that is going through the molecule literally in real time. You can read it at about six letters a second. It's incredibly cool. So you've got now the ability to go out and do genome sequencing of bacterial pathogens, viral pathogens, you name it, anywhere, anytime, in real time. And this unlocks the the key to sort of two really interesting possibilities in the medical space. And I think possibility number one is better diagnostics. So imagine you are running an extremely remote uh, laboratory somewhere, and you have cases of something that looks like a hemorrhagic fever show up at your clinic, but you don't know what it is. It could be Ebola, it could be Lassa fever, it could be dengue, it could be yellow fever. You don't know what it is, and you're a remote, under-resourced laboratory, so you probably don't even have the tests that you could run to say, is this Ebola or not? You just don't know what you can run. So what you do instead is you take a patient sample, like a blood sample, for example, you do a little bit of laboratory reactions to extract all the DNA out of that sample, and you simply load that DNA onto your flow cell on your portable sequencer, and it's going to be read in a matter of minutes. And what you do is computationally, you take each of the little reads that's coming off of this machine here, so this is plugged into your laptop, it's feeding data to your laptop in real time, you're taking the data that's going into your laptop, you're comparing it to a database of all the DNA that's ever been sequenced in the world, and for every little bit of DNA that the sequencer reads, your laptop is telling you, oh, this is a piece of human DNA, oh, this is a piece of Ebola virus DNA. So within the space of minutes, you can actually get a diagnosis, you can get an identification on that mystery pathogen. So right away, you're able to use this for figuring out exactly what does a patient have. And the second use case is in outbreak tracking, and this is what I've spent the last decade working on. So in the past, when you had one of the surveillance systems that Sherry described um, alerting you to an unusual number of cases of a particular disease, your public health laboratory is going to step in and do something called typing or DNA fingerprinting. They're trying to answer the question, are all these cases part of an outbreak? Are these cases epidemiologically linked to each other? Or are they just coincidence? Are they independent cases that happen to just appear at the same time in the same region? So the typing methods, the DNA fingerprinting techniques that we used to rely on for you know, years and years and years, 
are useful, but they're really low resolution. Um, so for every patient sample in your cluster of cases, you're gonna look at a tiny, tiny bit of its DNA, and you're gonna compare it to a tiny bit of the DNA from each of the other samples. And if they're identical, you can say, oh, okay, we probably have an outbreak on our hands. If they're different, you don't really have to worry so much. But the typing methods that we've used are always extremely low resolution, and they're not looking at the whole genome. They're just looking at a tiny amount of that DNA. And so I usually liken it to, if you're looking at a picture, like a digital image, and you've taken away 99% of the pixels at random, you can still get a rough idea of what that picture is, what you're looking at, and you can even compare that image to another one and say if they're identical or not. But you don't get the full picture. Now, though, thanks to technology like this, where you can actually read whole genomes, you can read all of the DNA instead of just a tiny fraction of DNA, you can actually quickly and cheaply get at that complete picture. You can look at 100% of the pixels. You can look at this perfect resolution. So instead of just saying, you know, yes, this is an outbreak, or no, this does not belong to the outbreak, you can actually go a step further, and you can say, this person transmitted to this person. Like, let's map out individual transmission events. So the way I like to explain this is uh, the analogy of the telephone game. Um, so this is where kids are, uh, you know, sitting in a line, a sentence is whispered to the first kid in the line, they whisper to the next kid who whispers to the next kid, to the next kid, to the next kid, so on. Sentence reaches the end of the line. Kid at the end says what they heard. Person at the beginning says what the original sentence was. And then everybody laughs because the sentence is mutated as it spread from kid to kid to kid. It's totally different at the end of the line than it was at the beginning. And this is essentially the same thing that's happening with a pathogen's genome, with its DNA, as it's spreading from person to person, as it's moving forward in time throughout an outbreak. It's accruing mutations gradually. So what we're doing when we sequence pathogens in DNA with something like this, look for all these little mutations. What we're doing is essentially, you know, doing the telephone game and then saying, okay, kids, just, you know, scatter yourself around the room randomly. And then we go up to each kid and we said, you know, what sentence did you hear? What sentence did you hear? What sentence did you hear? And then we try and figure out the order that they were sitting in. And based on what they tell us, we can make inferences like, oh, they were probably over here. Or they were probably further down the line. The pattern of mutations tells us the order that they were sitting in. So we do this with pathogen genomes. Instead of saying, you know, hey, kid, what sentence did you hear? We sequence the pathogen pathogen's genome taken from our sick patient. We do that across all of the cases in the outbreak, and then we're able to figure out exactly who transmitted to whom. So this sort of genomic data is like an entirely new frontier in terms of data type. This is like something that we have never really had access to before until we had technologies like this that really sort of democratized uh, genomics and DNA sequencing. So I'm curious, you know, Sherry, with your background in surveillance systems and integrating multiple disparate data types, how do you work this new biological data type into those systems? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point. I think there's a couple ways that we can think about that. So um, as you all know, you know, back in, like, I think it was November time frame, you know, everyone probably saw the jokes on social media that said it was safer to eat chocolate than it was <laughs> to eat romaine lettuce. Um, and it was really hard to find Caesar salad there for a while. Um, but this is exactly where this type of sequencing can probably help us get to the bottom of that a little bit quicker. So, you know, if health departments are starting to see upticks in gastrointestinal illness, um, they can go in and start to do this sequencing to kind of get to the bottom of it a little bit more quickly than we have been traditionally in the past. And I think we all are pretty familiar with the fact that we're seeing more and more and more um, of these, uh, you know, foodborne outbreaks. And technology like this is going to help us drive the timeline to the left and hopefully keep people from getting sick. Um, the Ebola is a little bit of a different story, as Jen already pointed out. So if you see people, in your, again, in a surveillance system clustering in a given region, um, you know, coming in with symptoms that look like viral hemorrhagic fever, you probably don't need to sequence everybody who's walking through the door. You, your real goal in this case is to get that initial diagnosis. And so you can sequence the first person, and then you don't have to expend the resources every time you see somebody come in. You can assume, okay, you know, they all have Ebola, but then what you can do is that 
you can utilize the sequencing to find out how is the outbreak evolving over time? Are people all getting the same type of strain? Um, you know, is, are they coming, are they related to each other? Are they transmitting to each other? Um, so there's really a distinction that needs to be made between um, using the sequencing for outbreak for early detection versus that ongoing outbreak investigation. Both have real utility. Uh, so at the beginning of the session, we talked about we really want to be able to predict outbreaks better. We want to be able to get ahead of them. And so we've talked about how we have two really new, interesting sort of streams of information that we can use, both better digital data and better genomic data. And so how are those two streams of data going to come together to help us stop an outbreak? And this is a pretty big question, so uh, it's probably easiest to kind of unpack it a little bit. Maybe the first part of that question, I'll direct it to you, David, and that is how do we know where the next outbreak is likely to happen? Because ideally we want to have our little portable sequencers and our digital epi systems set up there. Like, what does that look like? Yeah, they are cheap, but probably not cheap <laughs> enough to put everywhere. So yeah, we, we know that outbreaks uh, can and do occur everywhere in the world. Um, but there are something called hotspots, and, and these are specific areas of the world um, where it's thought that outbreaks uh, occur more frequently. There are actually many risk factors that probably can, can be predictive of, of where these hotspots are, um, but probably the chief among these is it's where most people are because, uh, as you know, disease follows people. So if there's, if there's a presence of a highly mobile population, that's, that's one of the key risk factors. Um, so whether that's through air travel or through uh, displaced persons, I, I, I think that's probably one thing that we should uh, consider when we place them. I think political or civil unrest is also really important to track. Uh, disasters, things like that, uh, they, they certainly uh, can lead to disruption of public health systems. And when you have disrupted public health systems, you get more outbreaks. You get more exposure to unclean water or sewage. So I, th I think that's another uh, key risk factor. And then climate change, and actually the resulting shifts in weather pattern, I think also lead to increased opportunities for infectious diseases. Uh, there's more standing water, there's more insects around, in higher temperatures, the insects are more active, so, so they can certainly um, bite you more often. Um, so sometimes um, uh, we also uh, can notice that um, when people are more associated with animals, uh, we see more infections. And, and these are called zoonotic infections. They can come from things like livestock or even domestic pets and wildlife. We actually just went to the Amazon uh, tent over here and did some puppy petting. Uh, <laughs> be careful about that. But um, uh, so, so these zoonotic infections are actually commonly viruses, and they spill over. That's a, a, a kind of a term that, that is being seen now in, in, uh, in public health uh, from exposure to these animals. Um, actually, when I lived in Peru um, in the 2000s, our lab responded to an outbreak of rabies in a small mining village in the jungle. So Madre Dios is the southern part of, of the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, and there were 25 deaths, unfortunately, and many of these were among children. Uh, it turned out that uh, there was an illegal mining operation that it expanded uh, gradually into the jungle. And unfortunately, it, it slowly hit a vampire bat colony and disturbed it. And it turns out that humans are the easiest uh, prey upon which vampire bats can, can feed. <laughs> kind of scary, but, but true. So understanding this connection, um, the public health officials were able to control the outbreak and, and, uh, and, and prevent that from happening again. So there are a lot of tools we can use to, uh, uh, you know, to help control these, these outbreaks. Um, and one of them um, is actually something that probably everybody has one or two here, so cell phones. <laughs> They're pretty ubiquitous, even in, in many uh, lower middle income settings. Um, the key here is that these uh, tend to follow people. I mean, most people have these with them 24-7. And when you go to bed, it's right next to you. When you go on a plane, it's, it's right next to you. So they not only follow you on holiday, they follow you if there's a disaster, uh, if there's a climate change event, um, but mainly through the, your routine daily life. And so remember, diseases follow people, and these follow people too. So we can use this as a proxy for people. Um, Actually, a novel way of using cell phone data was actually just published by a team from, uh, from Google, and they used it to, for outbreak detection in, in a couple U.S. cities. Um, what they were able to do is pair anonymized and aggregated search data uh, for symptoms of foodborne illness, so like nausea or diarrhea that you type into uh, your cell phone, um, with the prior restaurant locations that that cell phone and the person visited. Um, 
When those identified restaurants, so in that algorithm, were then inspected by local public health officials, they found three times the number of health code violations um, than in control restaurants. That's kind of gross. Um, but one of the obvious concerns here is individual privacy. So the data were definitely anonymized uh, prior to the analysis in an automated way so that no human at either Google or public health um, in those cities could identify individuals. Um, so this sort of digital epidemiology is really cool. I think it's only going to become more popular as we learn to leverage these types of data streams. Um, so it's important that, that we re-examine definitely the ethics surrounding this um, in, in a frequent and intentional manner. Um, I'll take this back to Sherry now to talk about disease surveillance systems. So we've got these disparate types of digital data, social media data, cell phone data. How do you see pulling those and pulling genomic data, which is a very different data type than these data structures here, how do you see that getting pulled into a disease surveillance system? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we absolutely need to go back to those days right after 9-11 where public health officials were feverishly looking for any data source that could uh, be correlated with uh, you know, with human disease. Um, so we do have to do that. Uh, but I think when it comes to genomic data in particular, we need to be doing more, and I think we can be doing more now. So right now I know that reference labs here in the United States do do uh, sequencing. However, they have not yet made their way into um, the disease surveillance systems. But the conversation has started. So we, what we really need now is some pilot efforts, both in the US as well as overseas, so that we can really understand how best to run advanced analytics anomaly detection on this type of data in a meaningful way so that we can give information to those public health decision makers. Remember that sequencing is very specific and individually focused, whereas a lot of these electronic disease surveillance systems are very population focused. So how does that information translate between the two, and how do you make it meaningful and actionable. Um, genomic data is very, very rich, but to the untrained user, it really is not useful at all. Um, but we really do need to, to push to have public health decisions really driven by the data. So what we really need to focus on now is, um, you know, is thinking about how to make that meaningful. And then, you know, we can think even bigger than that. Today, we're walking around, everything is smart this and smart that, and we all have the watches and the Fitbits. Um, and so how do we embrace that internet of things and pull information from wearable sensors that everybody is walking around with? And also these envisioned smart cities, they're just so much more data. Now, don't get me wrong, I will also say that just because you can get the data doesn't mean you should get the data, because public health is also having to deal with huge volumes, so you need to make sure that it's meaningful when you bring it into the system. So on top of data-rich countries, we also have to go back and think about um, our colleagues in the low and middle income countries where they're still developing a lot of what we would call their data ecosystem. Um, so remember, we talked about a lot of these places where there's a hotspot for a particular pathogen or vectors. Maybe we need to start considering doing routine surveillance as part of our surveillance protocol uh, in order to look for these blips or those sparks that Jen talked about earlier and that they may warrant further investigation. So for example, should we be sequencing animals in the wet markets in China uh, where SARS originated? What about flocks of birds uh, on migratory you know, flyways looking for novel influenza? Uh, and what about wastewater in areas that are prone to cholera? Um, you know, so that may sound really hard, but as Jen's talked about in her sh and showing you that min ion, um, people have really spent a lot of time developing what we would consider a mobile lab. So they are able to, you know, go out and do that sequencing, you know, right there on the spot. We don't have that, you know, reliance anymore on large fancy labs and uh, very expensive sequencers. The t it's in, it, the, this capability is within reach with these mobile labs. So I think if we look at existing populations population-based surveillance systems to identify some of these hotspots. That's how we can at least start to think about where we would place these mobile lab capabilities. Um, and then once you have pretty good surveillance coverage every, everywhere, you need to really then start to think about how do you bring that data in and start doing more modeling and you know, prediction and forecasting of where the next disease outbreak is going to occur and how it's potentially going to you know, spread within the community. So if we've got a combination of digital surveillance technologies and genomic sequencing that's acting sort of as our radar, like our early alert system, and when we detect a disease event, we're going to scale up our approach. We're going to start pulling in more data. We're going to start doing more sequencing. Um, but 
how do we make the most of this data? How do we really use it for good? Yeah, I think that's, that's really the key, right, is that we need to pr be providing medical intelligence. We need to be providing meaningful, actionable information. Um, we need to think about how are we going to handle such large volumes of data uh, when we know that various computers, whether they be in public health departments here in the U.S. or whether they're in these mobile labs, they don't have the same computing power as a computing cluster. And we need to really take that, uh, you know, take that into account. And we need to make the interpretation of these results very intuitive to non-experts. Um, at the end of the day, we really need to figure out how do we provide actionable information in a meaningful, appropriate, and sustainable way. Dave, you've done a lot of thinking about how you can make this data interpretable to people. How do you make genomic data uh, accessible to an audience that might not have a background in that? Can you walk us through that? Yeah, I, I would certainly echo uh, Sherry's comments about making uh, making these data intuitive. And, and you know, for the most part, um, in today's world, it requires a lot of uh, PhDs and training like Jen has to, to be able to interpret these data. Um, what we need is uh, for those data to be usable by public health officials. Um, and I think a good way to do that is to visualize these data. Um, I think many people learn that way. So there are a couple groups who are doing this. So Trevor Bedford and Richard Naher created Nextrain, which helped um, really to visualize genetic relatedness of pathogens. They started with influenza, but are actually doing things like Ebola now. So the Ebola outbreak that's ongoing in the Democratic Republic of Congo, they've, they have a, an analysis on, on their website. Uh, another investigator, David Anderson uh, from the UK, developed another one called Pathogen Watch, which helps to visualize it, the genetics of 17 bacteria, and really importantly, looking at the antimicrobial resistance genes of those bacteria. So there are a lot of groups doing this. Yeah, and these kind of data sharing and visualization platforms that you just talked about also facilitate something that I found really interesting over the last little while, which is crowdsourcing of data in an outbreak response. Um, so when you've got countries, when you've got large organizing bodies like the W. WHO and they're trying to respond to an outbreak, they're really kind of stretched to the max and a lot of the in-depth analytics, they just don't have the bandwidth to do. But what we've seen is when you release pathogen genomic data, when you release other data out there into the world in real time, groups of academics, groups of just interested people, enthusiasts, will gather around and start analyzing this data. We saw it in 2009 with H1N1, we saw it in 2014 with this unusual E. coli outbreak in Germany. People gather around open lab notebooks and wikis to share genomic data, to share the results of their analysis in real time. Um, and it's really, you know, a village coming together and you have non-experts occasionally, just interested people. Um, but that, that sort of crowdsourced analysis really relies on open and accessible data, and that's not the norm, is it? Yeah, I, unfortunately it's not, um, and increasingly so maybe. Uh, I think we all know now that the data is, is much more valuable than gold or oil or anything really. So it's collected, it's analyzed, aggregated, and packaged by our most successful tech companies, many of which sponsor this meeting, um, <laughs> as well as thousands of startups that are trying to catch up to those companies. And so like most data, pathogen genetic sequence data uh, is really most useful when it's aggregated and compared against a reference panel. Um, so the clear goal should be having building that reference panel so that uh, we can do those adequate comparisons. Uh, and to do that, really open sharing of data is needed. Uh, it really benefits global public health. Unfortunately, it's, um, it's sometimes challenging to do this uh, in practice because of academic concerns. So publishing papers uh, is how scientists get, get advanced. Uh, there's occasional uh, patent rights that, that some scientists uh, will patent a, a new bacteria. And then some countries actually have broader economic or political issues uh, that may relate to trade sanctions. Um, so I think we're all struggling with how to, to balance privacy, whether it's you know, individual patient privacy, um, with the ownership of pathogen genetic sequencing and, and how to share and maintain some control. And there's really no easy answers to this. Uh, there are m many groups who are actually experimenting with federated systems or multi-parity models of analysis where the data can be played with on a computer system but not completely uh, shared, not completely downloadable until uh, permission is given. So I don't think we have a great solution yet. Um, it, it may get even more complicated with international agreements such as the Nagoya Protocol that some of you may know about, but, um, but we're hoping for a more open data sharing. 
Awesome. Uh, well, we should close down now, um, and maybe let's just end on this thought, which is that if we go back to sort of five years ago, December 2013, it's a young boy, he's playing in a tree in a remote village in Guinea, uh, and he ends up becoming infected with the Ebola virus, and he becomes the first patient in what would ultimately be the largest Ebola outbreak ever recorded. It wasn't diagnosed as Ebola until many, many months later, and even once we knew, what it was. We didn't have the data, whether it was digital data or genomic data, early enough in the outbreak to really allow us to get a handle on that and control it um, before it spiraled into what it eventually became. And it really doesn't have to be that way. I mean, I think as you heard tonight, uh, we can use data to tell us where new infectious diseases are going to emerge. We can use data to alert us when there's an outbreak of interest. With portable DNA sequencing, we can quickly diagnose outbreaks. We can track those outbreaks and hopefully we can combine all of that information to stop those outbreaks before they get too far. So I guess my concluding thought is really that um, data belong to us as the public and it's us as public health's duty to use that data, to use that information to secure the public's health, to keep our populations healthy. So when I said at the beginning, you know, sanitation revolutionized public health in the 19th century, antibiotics and vaccines revolutionized 20th century public health really think that data is going to be the difference maker when it comes to 21st uh, century public health, but it's got to be open, it's got to be accessible, and we all kind of have to get behind it. So uh, thanks for coming out and listening to us talk about cooties for an hour and your happy hour. Um, we should probably leave you with the obligate public health warning to wash your hands regularly while you're at this meeting. Uh, I know it's 6 o'clock, so we have to wrap up, but the three of us will be up here on stage if you want to come ask us any questions. So have a safe and healthy uh, South by and enjoy your Sunday night.